year earlier. Yeah. Unemployment was expected to peak at nearly 12 per cent. Instead, it peaked at 5.2 per cent and has now fallen to just over 4 per cent, saving more than 2 million jobs. And with the fastest growing economy in the G7 this year, over 400,000 more people on payrolls than before the pandemic, and business investment rising, it is no wonder, Mr Speaker, that borrowing is set to fall from £320 billion last year, the highest ever peacetime level, to just £46 billion by the end of this Parliament. As we emerge from the depths of the worst recession in 300 years, we should be proud of our economic record. The economy is stronger because of the plan we put in place, because of the actions we took to protect families and businesses, and that plan is working. But for all the progress we are making, the job is not yet done. Right now, I know that the number one issue on people's minds is the rising cost of living. It is the independent Bank of England's role to deliver low and stable inflation. And the Governor will set out their judgments at midday today. And just as the Government stood behind the British people through the pandemic, so we will help people deal with one of the biggest costs they now face – energy. The energy regulator Ofgem announced this morning that the energy price cap will rise in April to £1,971 an increase of £693 for the average household. Without government action, this would be incredibly tough for millions of hard-working families. So the government is going to step in to directly help people manage those extra costs. Mr Speaker, before I set out the steps we are taking, let me explain what is happening to energy prices and why. People's energy bills are rising because it is more expensive for companies who supply our energy to buy oil, coal and gas. Of the £693 increase in the April price cap, around 80% comes from wholesale energy prices. Over the last year, the price of gas alone has quadrupled. And because over 85% of homes in Britain are heated with a gas boiler, and around 40% of our electricity comes from gas, this is hitting households hard. Now, the reason gas prices are soaring are global. Across Europe and Asia, a long cold winter last year depleted gas stores. Disruption to other energy sources, like nuclear and wind, left us relying more than usual on gas during the summer months. Surging demand in the world's manufacturing centres in Asia, at the same time as countries like China are moving away from coal, is further increasing demand for gas and concerns about a possible Russian incursion into Ukraine are putting further pressure on wholesale gas markets. And so, prices are rising. Mr Speaker, the price cap has meant that the impact of soaring gas prices has so far fallen predominantly on energy companies, so much so that some suppliers who couldn't afford to meet those extra costs have gone out of business as a result. It is not sustainable to keep holding the price of energy artificially low. For me to stand here and pretend we don't have to adjust to paying higher prices would be wrong and dishonest. But what we can do is take the sting out of a significant price shock for millions of families by making sure the increase in prices is smaller initially and spread over a longer period. Mr Speaker, without government intervention, the increase in the price cap would leave the average household having to find an extra £693. The actions I'm announcing today will provide to the vast majority of households just over half of that amount, £350. In total, the government is going to help around 28 million households this year. Taken together, this is a plan to help with the cost of living worth around £9 billion. We are delivering that support in three different ways. First, we will spread the worst of the extra costs of this year's energy price shock over time. This year, all domestic electricity customers will receive an upfront discount on their bills worth £200. 
Energy suppliers will apply the discount on people's bills from October, with the government meeting the cost in full. That discount will automatically be repaid from people's bills in equal £40 instalments over the next five years. This is the right way to support people while staying on track with our plans to repair the public finances. And because we are taking a fiscally responsible approach, we can also provide more help faster to those who need it most, the second part of our plan. We're going to give people a £150 council tax rebate to help with the cost of energy in April, and this discount won't need to be repaid. And I do want to be clear with the House that we are deliberately not just giving support to people on benefits. Lots of people on middle incomes are struggling right now too. So we have decided to provide the council tax rebate to households in bands A to D. This means around 80% of all homes in England will benefit. And the third part of our plan will provide local authorities with a discretionary fund of nearly £150 million to help those lower income households who happen to live in higher council tax properties and households in bands A to D who are exempt from council tax at all. We're also confirming today that we'll go ahead with existing plans to expand eligibility for the warm homes discount by almost a third so that three million vulnerable households will now benefit from that scheme. And that's not all we're doing to help vulnerable households. We're providing three billion pounds over this parliament to help more than half a million lower income homes become more energy efficient, saving them on average 290 pounds a year. Increasing the national living wage to nine pounds 50 an hour in April a rise of over £1,000 for 2 million low-paid workers, and we're providing an effective tax cut for those on universal credit, allowing almost 2 million households to keep an average of £1,000 per year. The payment through energy suppliers will apply across England, Wales and Scotland. Energy policy has devolved in Northern Ireland with a different regulator, and the government does not have the legal powers to intervene. But we will make sure the executive is funded to do something similar with around £150 million for Northern Ireland through the Barnet formula next year. And because the council tax system is England only, total Barnet consequentials of around £565 million will be provided to the devolved administrations in the usual way. Mr Speaker, I know that some in this House have argued for a VAT cut on energy. Yes, we have. However, that policy would disproportionately benefit wealthier households. There would be no guarantee that suppliers would pass on the discounts to all customers, and we should be honest with ourselves. This would become a permanent government subsidy on everyone's bills, a permanent subsidy worth £2.5 billion every year at a time when we are trying to rebuild the public finances. Instead, our plan allows us to provide more generous support faster to those who need it most, providing 28 million households with at least £200 and the vast majority receiving £350. It is fair, it is targeted, it is proportionate. It is the right way to help people with the spike in energy costs. Mr Speaker, today's announcements are just one part of the Government's plan to tackle this country's most pressing economic challenges. A plan for growth with record investment in infrastructure, innovation and skills. A plan to restore the public finances with debt falling by the end of this parliament. A plan to cut waiting lists and back the NHS with £29 billion over three years and a permanent new source of funding. And with the measures I've announced today, a plan to help with the rising cost of energy with £350 more in the pockets of tens of millions of hard-working families. That's our plan to build a stronger economy, not just today, but for the long term, and I commend it to this House. I now call the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Chancellor for his statement? We have known that this price rise was coming for months, and today we learn that the energy price cap will increase to £1,971 in April. In October, I called on the Government 
to provide immediate support for households, cutting VAT on their energy bills yep. and saving £200 of bills, with £400 in extra targeted support yeah, yeah. for those who need it most, yeah, yeah. which would mean for some of the poorest families in our country almost no increase in energy bills from that. April. The government have not done that today. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we all remember when the Prime Minister said that cutting the VAT was one of the benefits of Brexit. Yep. <laughs> he said, and I quote, when we vote leave, we will be able to scrap this unfair and damaging tax. Yep. Could there ever be a time when this policy is more needed yep. than it is today? Yeah. And I would have thought that the Prime Minister, <laughs> with his unblemished record of integrity, <laughs> would defend the commitments that he has made, yeah. but instead it's another pledge thrown onto the bonfire of broken Tory promises. Yeah. And the uncomfortable truth for the Chancellor is that even after what he has announced today, families in Britain will be still paying hundreds of pounds more for their energy, including some of the poorest families, mm -hmm. yep. from April as a result of the breathtaking rise in energy prices just announced by Ofgem. Millions of people cutting back to pay the bills. Citizens Advice have said that they have seen a record number of people in January struggling with fuel debts before the energy price increase. But what do the government offer? A buy now, pay later scheme that loads up costs for tomorrow. High prices as far as the eye can see. This year, next year, and the year after yeah, that, yeah, yeah, give yeah. with one hand now and take it all back later. Yeah. The party opposite used to talk about the nation's credit card. <laughs> well, today, Mr. Speaker, we've seen the Chancellor force British households to load up their credit cards. Yep. Yep. By lending billions of pounds to energy companies, <laughs> the Chancellor is gambling that prices are going to fall. Yeah. But they could go up further in October. What then? Billions more loaded onto yeah. people's bills? The best way of targeting support to those who need it most would be an increase to £400 and an extension to 9 million households of the Warm Homes discount, yeah. as Labour have proposed. Yeah. Yeah. Their scheme today is a pale imitation of Labour's, exactly. especially yeah. for the households and pensioners on the most modest incomes. Yeah. Yeah. The Chancellor instead is using council tax to target extra help. That will mean many of the poorest households will not get extra support, while some of the richest do. And it's people living in the North and the Midlands who will lose out most. The hypocrisy the day after the government's levelling up white paper is obvious. Order, order. Mr Holden, I think we need to be a little calmer. I'm sure you'll want to catch my eye, and it's not the way to do so. <laughs> so Chancellor Red to read. So can the Chancellor confirm how many people who are fuel poor will miss out on council tax support compared to the warm homes discount support that Labour have announced? Yeah. Mr Speaker, the government had a choice. Only today, Shell announced that their profits had quadrupled to $20 billion. They described their results as momentous. Dividends up. Profits up and people's energy bills up too. Yep. Labour's plan would impose a one off windfall tax on those excess profits. Yep. But this Chancellor would rather shield the oil and gas producers yep. while at the same time loading the cost onto working people and pensioners. Yeah. Cabinet ministers have described the oil and gas producers as struggling. Yeah. Struggling, Mr Speaker. Tell that to the one in five people who are already skipping meals so that they can pay their energy bills. Yeah. And Mr Speaker, this energy crisis has not happened overnight. It's a decade of dither and delay from the party opposite that has brought us to this point. A decade of failure to regulate our energy market. A decade in which they have slashed our gas storage capacity, leaving us more reliant than ever on Russia for our gas imports. A decade of failure to make the most of solar, tidal and wind energy. And a decade of stalled progress on insulating our homes to keep bills low, not just for one year, but into the future too. It has been the Tory decade that has led to this announcement, Mr Speaker, of the biggest increase in the price of domestic energy since records began. Yeah. That is what the Chancellor should acknowledge 
and should apologise for today. The Conservatives aren't solving the cost of living crisis because the Conservative Party are the cost of living crisis. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, uh, the opposition may have some sound bites, but they certainly don't have a policy. This government, has this government has announced measures. Mr. Seely, is there something wrong with that one you keep knocking? Because I think it's in good order. You don't need to test for one worm. Judge the exchequer. <laughs> in contrast, Mr. Speaker, this government has announced measures to share the burden with consumers and help manage the global price rise. And despite the, despite the faux outrage from the benches opposite, I'm sure that even they would admit privately, Mr. Speaker, the support just announced is both generous and comprehensive. Let me, uh, let, me, let me take some of the uh, Honourable Lady's points in turn, Mr Speaker. Well, first of all, first of all uh, on the topic of VAT, can I say, Mr Speaker, how very welcome it is that the opposition yeah. are recognising the benefits yeah. of Brexit? I hope they will join me in celebrating the fact that we have been able to change mass migration to this country yeah. after decades, yeah. that we can create new free ports in places like Teesside, yeah. that we can sign new free trade, free trade deals, and we can deregulate our economy to drive faster growth. Uh, she talked about VAT, Mr Speaker. Uh, what we are, VAT, on average, would be worth £90 to every household. What we are doing is providing £150 to those households who really need it, and delivering that support quicker, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Lady also tried to claim that uh, it, it was uh, the government's responsibility to manage global gas prices. Uh, it, it is very clear, and any person sensibly looking at this will acknowledge, that what is causing the increase in gas prices are global factors, as I outlined in my statement. Uh, no British government, no British Chancellor can change what is happening in Asia or indeed can stop a nuclear power plant from going offline in Germany. Uh, and she should acknowledge that, even in places like Norway. Electricity bills are rising because these are global factors at play, which she would do well to acknowledge. And I know the right honourable gentleman sitting next to her will know that, uh, having spent a lot of time on this. Uh, uh, thirdly, Mr. Speaker, I do want to I do want to address this point about uh, our support for the most vulnerable, because I am proud of this government's record in supporting those who need our help. The policies that we have announced today are progressive in their nature. A flat rate will, of course, mean far more to those on lower incomes or with lower energy bills, it is worth five times as much as a percentage of income for those in the lowest incomes as those on the highest incomes. And she talked about insulation. We are spending over this parliament three billion pounds yeah. to improve the energy efficiency and insulation of over half a million households in fuel poverty, Mr Speaker. That is the right thing to do, and it will save those vulnerable families on average £300 a year, not just this year, but every year going forward. And we have already announced those plans, uh, Mr Speaker. And lastly, to address her point on windfall taxes, and of course, of course, they sound superficially uh, appealing, Mr Speaker, but we on this side of the House deal with complex problems in a responsible way. Yeah. Now, now the, 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 obvious, the, obvious, the obvious impact of a windfall tax would be, Mr Speaker, to deter investment. Yeah. It's as simple as that. And at this moment, I want to see more investment in the North Sea, not less. Last year, Mr Speaker, we saw the lowest amount of investment on record in the North Sea, as my honourable friend pointed out just yesterday the other day. And there are billions of pounds, £11 billion of projects lined up to go. I want to unlock that investment because that is good for this country. It is good for British jobs, Mr Speaker, and it is good for our energy security. So, Mr Speaker, we will pursue policies that are good for the interests of this country, not just today, but in the future. And I know that my right honourable friend, the Energy Secretary, is working very hard to make sure that we have an energy market that is fit for the future. We have made investments in nuclear, which, as he rightly pointed out, investments in nuclear that were ignored by the party opposite when they were in power, that we are now fixing. So, in conclusion, Mr Speaker, I am not blind to the challenges that we face. I have to say, though, to the right honourable member opposite and her colleagues, we on this side of the House did not have the luxury of sitting on the sidelines and throwing stones. Faced 
Faced with the gravest of crises, this government chose to protect millions of jobs. It chose to support millions of businesses. It chose to invest in a world-leading vaccination programme. And it chose a balanced approach to COVID, so we could open up faster than anywhere else in Europe, Mr Speaker. We did these things at record speed at a time of great uncertainty. And we will always strive to learn from mistakes. Nothing is ever perfect when responding to a crisis. But I'd say to the party opposite, there is a fine line between reasonable criticism and political opportunism. And in my experience, Mr Speaker, the British people can always tell the difference. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome my right honourable friend's announcement today? Yeah, 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 yeah. Will, will he agree that a cut in VAT to solve this crisis is a completely flawed policy? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. As evidenced by the three economists who spoke to the Treasury yeah. Select Committee this week, including Torsten Bell from the Resolution Foundation, oh. who wanted something far more targeted, such as my right honourable friend has announced today. It is clear one factor in this crisis is Russia's willingness to weaponise its gas supplies. Will he confirm, if there is any incursion into the Ukraine, that this country and other international countries will look at weaponising our banking system, which would be economically catastrophic for Russia should they do that? Chancellor. Mr Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for his uh, question. Uh, on the point of VAT, uh, you know, nothing further to add, and he is right. That what we are doing is more targeted, it yeah. is faster, and it is more generous to those who need our help. Uh, and I can assure him that with regard to sanctions on Russia, absolutely nothing is off the table, and we are, wor- we are working very closely with our international partners, as the Foreign Secretary has outlined, to prepare a very robust package of sanctions. Yeah. SNP yeah. spokesperson Alan Brown. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Chancellor brags about having the fastest recovery, but that's actually wrong because Italy, for a start, has got a higher growth rate. But if the economy is doing so well, why is he still introducing a 12 billion uh, tax on workers um, this financial year? Why is it taking to the last minute to try and do something about the cost of living crisis? And then why is so much of this actually a loan that bill payers are going to pay back? He talks about not doing a VAT cut because he wants a more targeted approach. So how is giving everybody a rebate a, a targeted approach? It's targeted. illogical. Now, Mr Speaker, the reality is the Treasury is currently raking it in compared to where they thought they'd be in the March 2021 budget. An extra £3 billion this financial year next year from oil and gas revenues. VAT receipt predictions in October eh, last year was nearly £40 billion higher than what they were for, eh, for eh, March eh, 2021. So that's a lot of money the Treasury could be freeing up. Meanwhile, average energy bills increased uh, last, this year to nearly £1,200, up from £700 the year before, bringing in an extra £0.6 billion in VAT. The, the VAT increase due to the cap rise is going to bring the Treasury another £0.8 billion pounds a year, so there's so much more money they could free up. Now, the Scottish Government's bringing in the £20 per week child payment and then operating the child winter assistance yeah, yeah. payment. So could the Chancellor not look at doing something similar? Will he confirm that the council tax uh, rebate proposal he's bringing in will have Barnet consequentials, how much that will be, and that that will go to the Scottish Government? Will he look at devolving further budgets and powers so that Scotland can do a more targeted approach? Yeah. Now, National Energy Action estimated that the increase in the cap would put six million people into fuel poverty. So with his measures, what impact assessment has government made and how many households will be in fuel poverty? How many more premature deaths will there be because people are in fuel, uh, fuel poverty? And lastly, Mr Speaker, in the Highlands of Scotland, the Highlands generate electricity and send it to the rest of the UK, but yet users, electricity users in the Highlands and the restricted meters pay four pence a unit more for electricity, four hundred pounds yeah, more yeah. on their bills. When will the Treasury and bees spot with off gem to remove that ridiculous surcharge for these people in the Highlands? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm uh, I, I'm happy. 
Mr Speaker, I am happy to, uh, to confirm to the honourable gentleman that the Barnet consequentials uh, for Scotland will be around £290 million, which I hope that uh, he will welcome. And My honourable friend, the Chief Secretary, will be speaking to Kate Forbes later today to go over the details. And I very much hope that the Scottish Government will choose to do something very similar to what we are doing to the benefit of Scottish citizens. Of course, Scottish citizens will benefit from the rebate scheme on bills, because that is a GBY policy, uh, as I outlined. Um, and with regard to his, his broader points on uh, the North Sea, I, I, I said that there is a clear point of difference, I think, between us on this side of the House and the SNP, because we believe in the future of the North Sea. We believe in the oil and gas industry. We believe in those 200,000 jobs that it supports, and we want to make sure it plays an important part of our transition to net zero, Mr Speaker. Uh, and I, I hope that he can see that that is the right thing for Scotland and will join us in supporting that very important industry. For his excellent statement, particularly its thoughtful and progressive nature that, that, of the actions that he plans to take, does he agree with me that it is right to help not only the poorest but also those on middle incomes yep. who are yes. struggling with their household no, budgets? Absolutely. Yeah. No, my, my uh, honourable friend is absolutely right, and I know this is something that she has pressed me on on behalf of her constituents. It, a price increase of this magnitude impacts almost everybody, Mr. Speaker, and it is right that our response therefore helps almost everybody. That's what we are doing, making sure that those families that are working hard on household incomes of forty thousand or so will still get the one hundred and fifty pounds worth of support. Four out of every household uh, will benefit. We are on the side of hard-working families like that, Mr. Speaker, and I make no apology for it. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Mr. De Mr. Speaker. I see we now have the Klarna Chancellor, the pay now, uh, buy now, give, get it now, and pay later. But there is a really important issue about council tax. When areas like mine and parts of London, there are not many people in bands, certainly bands A to C. But who is going to fund the council tax rebate? Will that be fully? funded by the Exchequer and will there be a weighting of the £150 million fund to the areas like mine where I've got poor households in high value properties? Uh, Mr Speaker, just to confirm for the Honourable Lady, it's council tax bans A to D, so it is four out of every five, five households across England. Obviously, that will vary by region. Uh, I can confirm to her that will be fully exchequer funded, and on top of that, there will be a discretionary fund of around £150 million, uh, which the Department for Local Government will decide the best allocation formula for, and that will be able to be used by local authorities to help those low-income households who happen to live in high council tax ban properties and indeed those people, uh, students for example, that are exempt from paying council tax at all, but we would want to get the support to them. Peter Bell. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Conservatives believe in holding taxes down and putting more money in their people's pockets and so they can decide how to spend it. Socialists believe in raising taxes and then choosing to give it back in the form of discounts and rebates to selected people the government think need it. Could the Chancellor tell me his approach in increasing national insurance contributions and then handing money back to different people through uh, rebates and discounts? Is that a Conservative approach or a socialist approach? Well, I Mr Speaker, with the greatest respect for my honourable friend, I also believe that it is a Conservative approach to be responsible with this nation's public finances. I believe after recovering from the worst economic shock in 300 years, where borrowing spiralled to levels that we have not seen since World War II, that it is right and responsible to tackle that and get our borrowing and debt down to sustainable levels, which is why I have had to make difficult decisions, but also to fund the country's number one priority, the NHS, and an unacceptably high growing number of people waiting for for operations. That's what that funding will do. It's right that we provide a secure, long-term, sustainable funding stream for the country's number one priority, and they should be reassured that every penny of that levy is going to go to the thing that they care most about. Yeah. Stephen Tibbs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the, 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 there's an obvious unfairness in the massive profits being made by the oil and gas companies at a time when families are facing such great hardship. Surely the Chancellor must make an intervention to uh, address that. And 
he's announced a discretionary fund for local councils. Worried families will have no idea how much that will benefit them, if at all. Will he instead introduce an uplift in universal credit, having cut universal credit so unfairly just four months ago? Uh, Chancellor. Mr Speaker, it's worth pointing out that the energy companies that he talks about already yeah. are subject to a far higher rate of corporation tax. In fact, double the rate of corporation tax that other companies pay, 40% versus currently uh, 19 And I won't repeat my arguments about the windfall tax that I made earlier. Uh, and no, Mr Speaker, we believe the right way uh, is to keep, make sure that people can keep more of what they earn, which is why we cut the universal credit taper rate yeah. by 8 percentage points. That's a £2.2 billion pound tax cut. It will benefit 2 million of the lowest paid people in our society. It's making work pay. It's strengthening incentives to work. It's the right policy. It's a conservative policy. Here, Esther Mike Bay. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Many families across the country will struggle with their energy bills this year, so I am grateful that we have a chance who's in touch with that. Yeah, yeah, will yeah, he yeah. commit to continue to ensure those in Middle Britain are supported by this government, as well as those on the very lowest of incomes? Uh, my right honourable friend is absolutely right, and I can give her that reassurance. And hopefully, today's announcements will provide her with the confidence she needs that both I and this government are committed to being on the side of those hard-working families, which I know does she does an enormous amount to represent and champion in this house. Lawrence Shalami. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor mentioned that energy suppliers will apply the discount on people's bills from October. I am contacted by Vauxhall constituents on an almost daily basis. Residents living in properties that are too cold to heat. Residents pleading with me to help them get those repairs done. Current data suggests that over 8,000 households in Vauxhall are already living in fuel poverty now, Mr Deputy Speaker. So what does the Chancellor have to say to my constituents who are already unable to make ends meet now? And who are facing a hike of over £700 in their energy bills. Yeah. 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 Mr. Deputy Speaker, what I can tell them is they won't have to wait until October, as the party opposite's proposals would have had them do. They will receive £150 in April, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and then in October, and in October, they will receive the rebate on their bills at a time when the energy price cap will also be looked at again. So it will be appropriate that there is further action to support them. But this is why this policy is the right policy. By using the council tax system, we can get money to people faster, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Deputy Speaker. £150 in April for her constituents. Yeah. Matt Hancock. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I welcome this smart set of measures? Because we must retain fiscal discipline because otherwise the problem will get worse rather than better. But could I also ask a question about monetary policy, which the Chancellor mentioned? He mentioned the independence of the Bank of England decision, which has just uh, been announced. But there's some chatter about working in tandem with the bank. So can he confirm that in monetary policy, not just in interest rate setting, but in with the withdrawal of QE, that bank independence will be respected? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I can give my right honourable friend that assurance. It is absolutely right and proper that the bank is independent of government on matters of monetary policy. That is exactly uh, what has always been the case over the last two years and will continue to be the case, and I can wholeheartedly give him that assurance. Nick Smith. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor will be pleased that his campaign team are behind him today. <laughs> Does he really think that the super profits of $20 billion made by Shell are untouchable? His hands-off approach won't persuade many people across our country. Uh, well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think what millions of people across this country will see today is a government that is on their side. Yeah. It is a government that is taking action to help them with the anxiety they feel about rising energy bills. It is doing it in a proportionate, fair and targeted way, and it is doing it in a responsible way to protect them, not just today, but for years into the future as well. Robert Buckland. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thousands of families in Swindon and millions of households across the country will welcome the immediate help on council tax that he has announced today in his very welcome statement. Does he agree with me that the, uh, the cod analysis that we heard from the Right Honourable 
lay the opposite about the energy market in Europe is really a, a de demonstrable evidence of the paucity of the party opposite's uh, approach to energy. And isn't our approach to uh, a zero carbon economy, but based upon energy security, going to be the way that we deliver uh, our country out of these short term problems? Yeah. Well, my uh, right honourable friend makes, as ever, an excellent point. He's absolutely right. I agree wholeheartedly with him. And, and he will know my honourable friend, the Energy Secretary, is working very hard to undo some of the mistakes that the party opposite made in the past. Yeah. Chris Bryant. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I know the Chancellor's all pumped up, but this is, this is pretty puny stuff, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> 350, 350 pounds isn't going... £350 isn't going to touch the sides of the problem for my constituents in the Ronda. Gas and electricity up for the average family in my constituency by £686. Fuel up by £314. The average weekly shop up by £385. Universal credit cut by £1,040. National insurance up by £150. And frozen tax allowances by him will cost another £300. That's £2,875 in a constituency where the average wage is £27,000. That is really going to cause hardship. Yep. £350 doesn't even touch it. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the party opposite have proposals which would give considerably less yeah. to many people. Yeah. So it's a bit rich to hear that. But he, he had a long list of numbers, Mr Deputy Speaker. I also have a long list of numbers. 400,000 more people on payroll than there were before the crisis. Two million jobs saved because of the actions of this government. The national living wage going up by £1,000 a year in April and a £1,000 tax cut for millions of people on universal credit. Those are what we are doing, Mr Speaker, to put more money into people's pockets when they need it. And they can rely on us to continue supporting them, not just now, but for days and years into the future. Mark Harper much, Mr Deputy Speaker. First of all, can I thank the Chancellor for coming to the House to make his statement before he does a press conference. That's the right order of priorities. Can I also thank him for listening and engaging with colleagues on this side of the House to listen to their concerns and responding to them in his statement. And finally, can I also contrast the realism and honesty with which he's grappled with global gas prices. You can't pretend that they haven't gone up, but what he's done is set out a package to smooth the impact for everybody and to help those on the lowest incomes. That's the right approach, demonstrates why we've got it right and the party opposite are not fit for office. Yeah, yeah Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right. You know, those of us in government make responsible decisions yeah. and we are honest with people. I think people respect that honesty and it's the right thing for us to do, Mr Speaker. My honourable friend is absolutely right. There is a global surge in gas prices and it would be wrong to pretend that we do not have to adjust to that. But what we can do is take the sting out of that adjustment, spread its impact over time, limit its immediate impact. That's the right and responsible approach and I'm grateful for his support in that plan. Now, Shah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Yeah. The Chancellor comes here and says he's proud of his record. Let me tell you what my constituents are thinking of his record. The party opposite cut £20 a week for universal tax credit. Mm -hmm. It was dragged kicking and screaming here for U-turn after U-turn just to feed poor and hungry children. Yep. £350 doesn't cut it when he's wasted billions. Mr Speaker, more than £6 billion on wasted PPE, more, yeah. more than £4.7 billion on, tax, on fraud for, yep. for Covid funds. And he brings here nine, nine billion when he's lost 12 billion. So, you know, for my constituents, it doesn't quite cut it. And my constituents don't trust this government because they're not helping my constituents. Those at the bottom end are the ones that have been hit the most. It yeah. doesn't even come near the 700, let alone the cost of living. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady talks about universal credit. It was this government that provided the extra support to people during the crisis when they needed it. Uh, and actually, uh, all, all, all the data, all the evidence shows that through the worst of the depths of this pandemic, the actions of this government Absolutely. helped those on the lowest yeah, incomes Absolutely. the most. And it is a record I am enormously proud of. Yeah. Robert Halfen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I realise to the uh, champagne socialists on the opposite benches <laughs> uh, that £350 is not a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I have to say,
way, this oh, is. Up the swimming pool. And the, 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 yeah. my, my right honourable friend knows that I care about this issue deeply, and my constituents are just about managing. But this is a cost of living package for white men, uh, men and women on the country, uh, across the country, and in my constituency of Harlow. I could just ask him just to continue to do everything he can in the future to focus on those just about managing group of people who make up my constituents and make sure the government continues to cut the cost of living for hard-working families. Yeah. I, I, uh, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for his, his support and, and he rightly champions those people who are just about managing, who are working incredibly hard to build a better life for them and their families and they should know that this government is on their side. Yeah. Thank you very much Mr Speaker for his support because we will continue to champion them. Yeah. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. These plans are playing Russian roulette with taxpayers' money, yep. gambling that prices will go down, rather than providing a real solution to help families avoid skyrocketing bills. It's just delaying the pain while increasing taxes by £600 a year for the average household. So why won't you listen to our suggestions for a package that would actually help families reduce their bills by £1,000 a year? Surely it's time to admit he's got it wrong. It's time to scrap the Conservative tax hikes. No, 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 no. Well, Mr Speaker, what we haven't heard from the party is any plan to provide the funding that the NHS needs. Yeah. Right? It, it, we all know that the NHS is grappling with recovering from Covid. There's an unprecedented scale of backlogs to work through that, and social care system that needs urgent reform. The only way to grapple with those challenges is to provide the NHS and social care with a sustainable source of funding. That's what we are doing. It is the responsible and right approach. It is a progressive approach and it will benefit people in Scotland, Wales in Northern Ireland as well as England, and in the long run, it will be the right thing for this country. Alan Cairns. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I congratulate my right honourable friend for the comprehensive package of support that he's uh, provided, both fiscally responsible in the face of the uh, uh, energy uh, uh, volatility uh, globally. Uh, my constituents will have the benefit and the reassurance of the rebate that he's announced uh, on energy bills, but they won't have the reassurance of the council tax support that he's making available in England. Will he therefore uh, at least encourage the Welsh Government to follow suit so my constituents have the same benefit as in England, or even take it a step further and insist that the benefit is passed on? Yeah. Uh, I thank my honourable friend. I can confirm that the uh, Welsh administration will receive £175 million or so in Barnet Consequentials, which will enable them to provide the similar discount. And uh, my honourable friend, the Chief Secretary, will be speaking to the Welsh Government later today, and he will very much make the point uh, that we would like to see that to the benefit of all of his constituents and those across Wales. Clive Betts. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> in terms of the council tax rebate, there are some of the poorest families who don't pay uh, a significant amount of council tax because they're on council tax support schemes. Will they still get, even if their council tax bills are less than £150 a year, the full £150, will that therefore be paid in cash to them uh, in, in, by, by the local authority in April? And in terms of the £150 million discretionary fund, will it be truly discretionary for councils to decide how they spend it, or are the government going to direct how it's spent? Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, of course the uh, Honourable Gentleman is well informed on these issues. Uh, our intention is that those people do benefit from the £150, and that's why we are providing the discretionary fund. It's been sized with a sense of who those people are and how many they are. We will, of course, provide some guidance to local authorities about who we would expect the support to go to, but ultimately they will be able to make those decisions for themselves. John Penrose. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, can I um, thank the Chancellor for an extremely welcome package and it's, uh, it's the latest step I think in a series of very strong uh, reactions to different crises throughout the pandemic and now today. Uh, he also mentioned improving the investment in North Sea, or, uh, North sea um, gas fields, which is very welcome. Yeah, very but welcome. it is only a temporary set of issues. It's only a temporary set of solutions which will dull the initial economic pain without solving the long-term problem of sky-high energy prices. What conversations has he therefore had with his colleagues sitting next to him, the Energy Secretary, about solutions to deal with those longer-term problems? And when can we expect to hear answers to those things to do with um, reforming the price cap, reforming the wholesale energy market and the like? 
Yeah. Well, well, my uh, honourable friend is very thoughtful on these matters, and he's long made this point, and he's right to make this point that we must also make sure that the long-term energy market is working uh, in all our benefit. I can tell him that both uh, the energy secretary, myself, and the prime minister have been involved in these conversations for quite some time. Uh, the energy secretary is working on a set of measures which will address, I think, many of his concerns, and he should expect to hear from the government soon. Alex Davis Jones. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I just say how nice it is to see the Chancellor finally in his place? I know some of us have been considering filing a missing person report but uh, given his absence in the recent weeks and whilst I appreciate his update for families across Pontypridd and Tafili it's just another case of too little too late the Welsh Labour government have doubled the warm home discount scheme and Labour's proposal would have taken £600 off the bills for the poorest in our country the Chancellor's plan gives them £350 off why has this fallen so far short of what is needed and what is proposed? Yeah. Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I'm sorry that she didn't welcome the £175 million yeah. in Barnet consequentials for the Welsh administration, uh, but also uh, this government is providing support, significant support, to those on middle incomes because they are also struggling, Mr. Speaker, and we believe that is the right approach. Bob Seeley. Very much indeed, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I welcome very much the Chancellor's recognition, as my honourable friend was saying, of the importance of a long term energy policy. And also, thank you very much indeed for his help for council taxpayers. The ATD ban will cover most folks on the island. Can he just confirm to me that he's talking about people with primary residences, both on the island but also nationally? Thank you. Councillor. Yes, uh, my uh, honourable friend makes an excellent point, and I can confirm that that uh, £150 is not for those with either second homes or empty homes, and we will make that crystal clear in how the policy is executed. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. First of all, can I thank the Chancellor for, for his contribution? It's not to be Charlie said, there's a bit of money that's been set aside. We, we appreciate that. But with this further right of energy, along with the uplift of the cost of living in general, we are looking at working families and choosing what to cut out of their lives to make ends meet. Whilst I very much welcome the news and put it on record, the £150, 150 million for Northern Ireland and also the other Barnet consequentials that will come along as well, could I ask the chance to answer this question? Would he consider and commit to reviewing the child benefit threshold for families whose wages are the same and yet it simply isn't worth the same in real money terms as it did when the threshold was introduced in 2013? Thank you very much. Well, I'm grateful to the uh, honourable gentleman uh, for his question, and, and I'm glad he recognises there are two sets of Barnet consequentials for Northern Ireland stemming from each of the two policies, which sum total £250 uh, million. Pounds. Uh, he will appreciate I can't comment on future tax and welfare policy, but as always, I will uh, take what, what he says and, and reflect on it. Uh, Jonathan Gullis. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I warmly welcome the Chancellor's statement because of 94% of properties in Stoke-on-Trent are council tax band A to C. So, therefore, this £150 rebate is going to do wonders across Stoke-on-Trent, North, Kidsgrove and Tor. But on his recent visit to the city of Stoke-on-Trent, he knows that the ceramic sector is an energy-intensive industry and is going to be looking for some more creative solutions in the short term to help them with rising energy costs. Can he uh, confirm that he will meet with me and the other Stoke-on-Trent MPs to discuss his ideas further? Councillor. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm always happy to meet with my uh, honourable friends from Stoke, which benefited from not just one, not just two, but three uh, successful levelling up fund bids, uh, which I was pleased to visit recently. Uh, he's right, and he's a, a proper champion for the ceramic sector in this House. Rightly, I, I always enjoyed meeting representatives from that sector on my recent visit. I'd be happy to meet with him and them to discuss the situation further. Barry Shearman. <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, we all know that the uh, Chancellor is a fast-talking, slick operator who knows how to keep your head down when it's useful. Indeed. But can I tell him that someone who's been in this house since 1979, he's the most incompetent Chancellor <laughs> I've ever seen. <laughs> and when children go to bed, when children... He doesn't like it, Mr Speaker. When children in my constituency go to bed with no food in their tummies, with no heat in their homes, what does he really think is the honourable position of a Chancellor who has just allowed one of his policies directly to be taken in fraud, £4.3 billion of fraud under his watch? Any other Chancellor that I've known would have come to the House today to resign. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I'll let this government's record on economic policy speak for itself. It's a record I'm proud of. Um, 
But I can provide uh, the honourable gentleman with reassurance that I and the government remain committed to tackling fraud wherever we see it. Uh, he mentions a figure uh, in, in £4.9 billion. Pounds. As I mentioned to the House in Orals uh, on Tuesday, that estimate has already been reduced, Mr Speaker, by a third, uh, by £1.6 billion because of the actions we are taking. I won't go into them all now, but he should know that we will go after everyone wherever we can to recover that money for the taxpayer, and I'm confident that we will do a very good job. Jacob Young. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. This is a targeted package that helps us just about managing, which is entirely right. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, under the last Labour government, the party opposite closed six nuclear power stations and had a policy of no new nuclear. Does he agree with me that alongside these uh, these measures to help people in the short term, it's imperative that we invest in our long-term energy security, in domestic gas production, in renewables and, crucially, in new nuclear? My honourable friend is absolutely right about some of the failures of policy that the party opposite propagated in power. That is being fixed, my honourable friend, the uh, Energy Secretary. We are not just investing in new nuclear, as he said, with billions of pounds at the spending review, but also in offshore wind and, as he knows in his part of the world, carbon capture and storage and hydrogen, where Teesside is playing a starring role in that green energy revolution. Ben Lake. The Chancellor will be aware that nearly 20% of households in Wales uh, are not connected to the main gas grid. In rural areas like Ceredigion, that figure actually rises to over 80%. Um, and research by the Office of National Statistics notes that Ceredigion suffered the highest increase in fuel bills of any area in mainland UK in the past year, increasing by £863 on average. So, can I ask the Chancellor to confirm whether the rebate announced today will also apply to households that are not connected to the main power grid? The Honourable Gentleman actually makes an, an excellent point, and one that colleagues not just in Wales but in England and Scotland will also uh, be asking, uh, not least my own constituents. What I can tell him is the rebate will be delivered through electricity bills to solve that exact problem that he mentions, which is obviously much more universal. Uh, and separately, obviously, the council tax discount in England is through the council tax system, so it's agnostic to the heating source. And I would expect the Welsh Government, should they choose to do the same thing, uh, will also be able to solve that problem in that way. Um, Jane Stevenson. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, it, this is quite simply a superb plan. We're very well done. Yay! And I would also say that uh, he's right to question the opposition's idea of a windfall tax, given yeah, yeah. Gordon Brown completely stifled the telecoms market in the late 90s by doing exactly the same. Speaking as the chair of the APPG for district councils, I wonder if my right honourable friend would join me in thanking councils for once again being able to offer swift and agile responses uh, to local communities and families in helping us to deliver this today. Thank you. Oh, I, uh, as a former local government minister, Mr Deputy Speaker, it gives me great pleasure to pay tribute to district councils and the work of the district council network. Um, uh, head of John Fuller is still running it, but they do an excellent job. And once again, when we need them to help us deliver policies, they step up. Uh, I can confirm also they will, of course, receive New Burdens funding for doing that. But I thank them for all the work they do. She's right to champion them. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, already before COVID, a third of children in Hull North, many in working families, were living in poverty. With the cost of living crisis and the energy prices soaring, will the measures that the Chancellor is introducing today see an increase or a decrease in the number of children living in poverty by Christmas? Yeah, good question. Mr Speaker, thanks to the actions of this and previous governments, since 2010 there are 200,000 fewer children living in poverty uh, as a result of the actions that governments have taken. And also we know that children growing up in workless households are five times more likely to be in poverty than those who have working parents, which is why it's a very good news that the number of children in work 